Hi and welcome to Matrix Moments. This is Saloni and on today's episode we have Sudipto and Natisha from the Matrix team talking about B2B marketplaces. This is part two of a multi-part series where we cover all things B2B marketplaces and on today's episode we dive into the makings of an ideal B2B marketplace. Tune in. So Sudipto, I agree that the timing is right and the market is super big, right? But we also know that there are so many permutation and combination of models that are possible in this space, right? Yes. Some are starting supply first, some is demand, some part of it is fragmented, consolidated. Should we play with working capital or not? Uh, should we build in a commoditized play or should it be a differentiated? Should it be distribution first? Should it be vertical, horizontal? There are just so many things that a founder thinks of or an investor thinks of or of any person, right? Looking at these value chains. So I know I'm like, you know, we have had multiple discussions over as to how do we look at companies. Yes. Uh, and I know that as Matrix and uh, across our valuations and portfolio learnings, we have had like very strong points on what kind of models do we prefer over the other, right? So just to probably like to like, you know, discuss on a couple of them and share insights with the viewers. So first of all, I think the first uh, most strongest bias that I always hear from you and we have seen it working for our portfolios is that you've told me time and time out always vertical marketplaces right you can just never go horizontal in b2b so why is it so right what has brought you to this particular learning uh, if you could just share sure and and before we discuss more the only caveat is to our views this is our thesis and uh, we might be right or wrong uh, finally it's founders who essentially uh, end up executing and, and a lot of times proving us wrong and, and we learn in the process so uh, sort of uh, please bear with us and if you think we are wrong would love to hear views from viewers as well um, but internally at least for b2b there are two three things that we definitely look when we look at whether this market is something we want to invest in and the first thing for us is vertical marketplaces now why vertical right uh, in B2C, for example, horizontal marketplaces become really, really big. And all the large companies globally across geographies have been horizontal marketplaces. Now in B2C, why horizontal and B2B, why vertical? So if you look at B2C, right, what does a marketplace do? They essentially acquire a customer by probably selling electronics at a very competitive price. And then over a period of time, make money by selling clothes, private labels, by selling books, by selling a lot of other products which are more high, higher gross margin and you can make money from them. So B2C is essentially how do you acquire a customer and then amortize that CAC by selling a lot of other products where you can make money. And it's a long LTV by CAC uh, game where once you've established brand and trust and repeat, the customer keeps on repeating and buying multiple different products from you. Now let's take B2B. You sell electronics to a customer. Will that customer ever buy fashion from you? No, it's very sticky to like one vertical. So the, the guy who sells electronics, the retailer who sells electronics does not sell fashion. So you cannot essentially acquire a customer and sell multiple different products to them. So the customer set across verticals is different. Then let's see who is supplying. In B2C commerce, there's a wholesaler generally, there are multiple wholesalers who aggregate different products and then sell on Flipkart and Amazon, for example. In B2B, uh, the, the fisherman is selling fish, the farmer is selling agri products, the shoe factory in Agra is selling shoes, yeah. uh, you, the, the clothes factory in Tirupur is selling clothes, the chemical factory in, in Gujarat is selling chemicals. So the kind of factory and the form factor of factory and the geographical disposition of the factory is very different. So customers are different, the sellers are different. On top of that, your logistics and supply chain is completely different. In B2C, you have this uniform box under which everything fits. In B2B, um, your fish obviously is sold differently. Agri products will be sold in a truck. Shoes will be sold from size uh, say 6 to 12 with different combinations of pairs. Clothes will be sold from XS to say triple XL. Everything that you are selling, the box, the packaging, the size, the truck that you need, cold storage, non-cold storage, first mile, last mile, is completely different. Yeah. On top of that, credit, payment, underwriting, that is again very different for each supply chain. So supply chain to supply chain, there's almost no synergy. Customer different, supplier different, logistics and supply chain different, credit, underwriting and payment different. Which means if you want to do horizontal, you are not building one company, you are building multiple companies. And we generally believe that a strong founder who is trying to solve one problem really well, 
generally will always do that better than somebody who's trying to solve four or five different things together which is why we believe that vertical marketplace is a great place to start with and till you get to a certain amount of scale say a few hundred million dollars of gmv stick to one vertical do that really well get pmf get to profitability get to very good rosy characteristics and then it is okay to expand horizontally into sort of adjacent se sectors but to begin with if you want to do multiple different verticals it becomes very tricky because there are nuances learning org building and, and, and everything which you need to do differently from vertical to vertical which is why focus on vertical marketplaces and all our investments yeah, have been have vertical been marketplaces yeah i mean i agree it's completely reflecting in our portfolio's performance also so hopefully it continues to grow that way fingers <laughs> crossed on that but on on that point right when you were talking about that the supply base is different the demand base is different i know we have had a very strong thesis that the supply has to be fragmented it is the demand side if it's fragmented it's very good even if if there's a little bit of consolidation through some of our portfolio companies we've seen that that also works right so on demand side maybe it could be like fragmented and even if there's some sort of consolidation we are okay with it but supply side has to has to be fragmented right this has been a very like you have been in turn you are very strong advocate of that point and uh, would just to un- love to understand your views around it right fair so see we are trying to invest in great businesses obviously great founders were founders first but great founders building very good businesses so what is a great business and we'll cover a little bit later as well a great business is where you can build a very large outcome with very little amount of capital how do you build a very large outcome it is essentially tam size of the market into percentage share that this company can get into the margins you can create out of that pool which gives you the net earnings that you have and then you have a multiple and that sort of gives you a valuation the amount of money required is generally money that goes into cac working capital and capex these are the major variables salaries and everything you can take aside but these are the major variables right so we're essentially looking for businesses that in the end state can a be large with a lot of gmv pool two can have very high net margins and three have limited working capital capex or cac now in b2b generally cac is not an issue so you can take out that from the equation we are looking at large markets with large market share high contribution margin with low working capital and low capex if you can do that you are building a very good fundamentally strong business so that's the overarching architecture now there are so many vertical b2b marketplaces right tam is very easy if you are not above a certain tam say 5 10 billion dollars don't build in that space but even if you do that cut as you said right there are so many different verticals like milk and seafood and fashion and then different parts of the supply chain finished good raw material etc you have n cross and n combinations and we can end up investing in 100 marketplaces how do we decide out of this which marketplaces will have good business characteristics and for that going back we want to be in supply chains where end state you can create good amount of contribution margin with a low working capital how do you do that and then from there we can come to the fragmentation question see if the marketplace is not adding value and is just a trading platform that is taking one packet from the supplier and then delivering that pa- packet to the buyer you cannot make a lot of margin because you are not adding value so finally we are in the business of investing in great businesses and the quality of a business comes back to essentially what we just discussed right that can we make a lot of margin and can we do it with low amount of working capital and if the business is not adding value and it's just a trading business which is essentially moving boxes say from point a to point b you cannot make that much amount of money so now when can a marketplace add value and can make margins see if the end customer or the buyer trusts the supply brand and not the marketplace then the marketplace cannot make a lot of margin so for example in fmcg if i'm buying something from itc I care about ITC, not the marketplace or platform that I'm buying from. If in electronics, if I'm buying a Xiaomi phone, then I care about the brand Xiaomi, not about the uh, marketplace, right? So in each, if your supply is consolidated and branded, then the end customer has complete trust on the supplier, and they don't care about the marketplace. The marketplace essentially is moving boxes and adding working capital. In a business of moving boxes and adding working capital. you cannot make more than 1 to 2% of net margin 
because there are already stakeholders present in the supply chain the supply chain has been well oiled and people who make money are essentially making that money because of the labor that they are putting in and to make a lot of margin out of that becomes very difficult however if the supply is unbranded and completely fragmented right i as a customer don't know which factory from surat the clothes are coming or which factory from agra the shoes are coming I or which fisherman yeah. which fisherman is selling right in all the situations the market is becomes important yeah. so if supply is consolidated and branded the end buyer trusts the supplier or the manufacturer the marketplace cannot make a lot of margin if the end if the sub, uh, sort of supply is fragmented and unbranded the end buyer will always trust the marketplace that they will dis- enable me to discover the right products do the qc have trust on the marketplace they will deliver the things on time which is why the marketplace becomes powerful also in these categories there is no mrp which means you can actually create margin out of it right and instead if you have to build a 7 8% ebitda business yeah. which means you need a 20% gross margin you will need all of these characteristics in the marketplace which will ties back to our original point that what makes a great business right तो अगर सात आठ परसेंट एबिटा चाहिए तो सप्लाई फ्रेगमेंटेशन बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है without that end state you can't make a 7 8% ebit of business so that to the same point and i completely agree right and uh, we have discussed this that the supply chain the supply, uh, the marketplace needs to add value across uh, the quality uh, the branding part of it and then the supply chain logistics and the working capital can all pursue right and it also gets the pricing part and the margin part but in the beginning right and we have uh, like we faced this question from a lot of early stage founders that it's a chicken and egg problem you have to get the consolidated suppliers the big brands because the demand side is asking for it they are saying they will only come to the platform if we can get goods from these particular brands so you start with the consolidated suppliers and then when investors evaluate they are like your supplier is consolidated right and then like the founders say that ultimately it's going to be the long tail of it that we will eventually build so what about the timing of all of this like does a b2b marketplace start with uh, fragmented suppliers or does that eventually build over time right like how should the founders think about it so it's a choice of category see if i look at the trillion dollar stack right if you look at lifestyle categories there's hardly anything branded especially when you're selling in the retailer segment if you look at uh, most of every commodities right there's hardly anything that is branded if you look at the raw material supply chain in terms of commodities and steel in chemicals and construction materials Uh, there's hardly anything that's uh, that's truly branded right and branded will be a very small portion so choosing the category itself gives you an answer if the end customer is looking for branded products then it becomes very difficult to build marketplace but say, if you're building a marketplace for fashion the end retailer is not looking for branded products they're looking for variety they're looking for new designs they're looking for quality all right in seafood nobody is looking for a branded shrimp they are yeah. looking for good quality shrimp right? yeah. Yeah. so it's the choice of marketplace although i agree on your point of starting with something should be consolidated both sides cannot be fragmented exactly. which is why consolidated demand makes sense that you take fragmented supply but start selling to large retailers or large brands to begin with so that you can at least have one side of the marketplace which gives you volume Got it. for example when capital fresh started they focused a lot on the modern trade and the online retailers like the licious fresh to homes of the world that give enable them to scale so really fast and which ensure that their supply chain and the and, and sort of the procurement function which is key to success scales up super fast because you were having demand right now once you started doing that and your sub, pieces of supply chain and logistics fell into place then you sort of diversify demand and went into retailers went into exports went to and started doing b2b to c so on the demand side starting with consolidated demand and then going into more fragmented demand makes sense but supply i would still say it's better to look at sort of segments where supply is fragmented you will have to take that effort say of 6 months to 12 months to actually go on the ground catalog that supply aggregate that supply build qc and trust and get that supply onto your platform but once you do that you have a clear reason to exist because nobody out there has that supply of products and if you have a very good high quality supply of products at the right price and you will have the right price because you will have economies of scale compared to the unorganized segment you will always win when you go to demand you can see unlike b2c in b2c the end customer ka actual job in life is not procuring 
प्रोडक्ट्स फॉर देयर हाउस होल्ड उनके एक जॉब है ऑन टॉप ऑफ दैट दे आर परचेजिंग फॉर फन सो व्हेन एवर दे लाइक अ ब्रांड दे स्टिक टू द ब्रांड दे विल नॉट ऑलवेज फिगर आउट व्हाट व्हाट आर ऑल द अदर ब्रांड्स आउट देयर एंड डू अ प्राइस क्वालिटी कंपैरिजन इन बीटूबी द परचेस मैनेजर्स एंटायर जॉब इन द एंटायर ईयर is to get better quality products at a lower price yeah. that is his job he is doing that this is a purchase function so there they will evaluate all possible outcomes and take the best combination of price and quality which is why if you can get supply at scale do the that's not the case for b2c which is why b2b is supply first if you are doing supply first fragmented supply and if you are doing fragmented supply supply first do vertical which is sort of the uh um, the foundation of our thesis when we look at look at markets yeah and i mean as as you always say right the more fragmented your supply base is the harder you want to replace right so i mean if it's consolidated anyone can take those suppliers and create a separate company and then you can't do anything about it yeah, so that's yeah. your point. A, a small anecdote and this one is for demand right side right but say for example if somebody wants to build a flipkart ola or swiggy a b2c company with say 30 40 million customers right even if you spend 10 dollars in acquiring that customer you will spend 300 400 million dollars and by the way in 10 dollars in today's market you can't acquire a customer <laughs> but still you, you yeah. have to spend 300 400 million dollars if you take a b2r business or a reseller business where most of the business probably is powered by 50000 people right there even if you spend 1000 dollars ki competitor ke 50000 power sellers resellers and retailers hai unko ja ke 1000 dollar de deta that's a lot of money in india and say please find my product You will spend fifty million dollars to acquire that set of customers. Now, if your sales actually is happening to with only hundred customers, you can go and give them hundred thousand dollars and say, "Boy, unka product use mat karo, mera product use karo." And that hundred thousand does not need to essentially be in terms of direct payment. It could also be discounting and stuff like that. Within ten million dollars, somebody can come and snatch your customers. So any fragmentation is always moot. Yeah. consolidation is always risk fragmentation is always more which is completely uh, like something that you know we all agree with so continuing our discussion on b2b i think we have talked a lot about what does a good market or a good founder look like right but what does a good business look like right so what about their business fundamentals what do you think around that fair so in b2c right uh, it is very important for um, businesses to ensure the customer tries a product and then you create a habit of stickiness around it and then over a period of time you make money right there was a lot of great b2c companies are habit forming or habit changing companies you never never used to uh, a cab coming in 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 5 minutes or food coming in 10 minutes and and they make it possible for you right b2b is not habit changing or habit for uh, uh, sort of ha- habit changing or or new customer behavior customers were procuring now you are giving fundamentally more quality more assortment or better price and 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 better tax or credit right so for a good b2b business you cannot start building a contribution margin negative business and hope to become contribution uh, contribution margin positive overnight because if you are cm negative especially cm1 negative and people are buying from you they are buying from you because you are cm1 negative not because you are changing habit and the moment you want to increase price Uh, you will not be able to essentially attract the customer, right? So in B two B businesses, being margin focused is very important, and always build a C M one positive business on day one, which means that that transaction at least is making money and people are buying from you because of your quality of service and not because you are cheaper than market price. So C M one is very important. We also prefer C M to positive, but we are cognizant of the fact that sometimes you will have excess capacity built in. Sometimes you will be uh, burning a little bit of branding and marketing to acquire customers. Your sales funnel may not be the most optimized to begin with, so probably you are CM to negative to start with. But over a period of time, there should also be a path to CM to break even. So one thing is around your margins in unit economics, very important for B two B, and CM one positive is a must to begin with, right? Second is a question of working capital, because in the end, in what is a good business? It is all about your margins and how much margins you can make. with limited amount of capital and the place where capital truly grows goes in b2b is in working capital right the second thing is can you build a business with maybe the best is if you can start with cash if people are buying you from cash it is very clear it is because at the quality of the product that you are giving to the customer right if that's not possible start with 10 to 15 days of working capital 
the less the number of working capital if you are essentially giving 100 120 days working capital to someone right and they are buying because of working capital then i buy pmf that's not true pmf and the more the number of days of working capital becomes the more demand so if, for example if you have a 3 months working capital versus say 15 days working capital if you have to build a billion dollars gmv company right which means uh, broadly say 100 million a month yeah. if it's a 3 month working capital yeah. cycle you need 300 million dollars if it's 15 days you will need 50 million dollars and that is where your dilution your rossi and the quality of the business is truly impacted so in certain segments say for construction you will need to have higher working capital days but then you need to be extremely commercial you need to figure out the right processes for collection underwriting so that nps don't happen but in general having working capital in check or if working capital cycles are huge having a very strong finance and collections department is extremely critical so when we generally look at a b2b business there's a lot of focus on four things margins working capital third is growth obviously growth is great but in a b2b business if you're growing 3 3 and a half to 4x year on year that's great growth in the initial stages and 2 to 1/2x at at a late stages is actually great great growth the fourth is cohorts and especially supply side cohorts so if you have to look at pmf in an early stage business most of the pmf comes from cohorts people who are selling on you are they selling more and more and more which means because of you are they actually getting more money are they satisfied with the service similarly on demand are demand cohorts growing with time so good b2b business looks like growing 3 and a half 4x year on year contribution margin on profitable clear path to cm to profitable and end step ebit of at least 5 percentage plus a working capital less the better if it's less than 30 days great because then that gives you great rossi characteristics and very strong supply cohorts and reasonably good demand cohorts that's what a ideal b2b business looks like um, whenever you see a business like that please invest <laughs> That's amazing, sir. So thank you actually so much for sharing, and especially the point around CM, right? That really hits me because even when we meet the founders, it seems like it's not pinching them at all that the CM one is negative, right? And it's probably because they have seen no, multiple. No, all all great founders it pinches them. Like all the for the great founders. So for the early founders, right? For the young founders, they see businesses even with CM two, and they do not. Say like a sector specific answer, right? They will quote some consumer company. They were also CM one, CM two negative but, in but that way. But what you should quote are all the B two B unicorns. Exactly. All the B two B unicorns are a bit the profitable. Exactly. Forget CM two profitability, right? They are unicorns for a reason because they are proving profitable, scalable PMF. Yeah. And and that should be your aspiration. Be in all the at least companies we have invested in our portfolio. They're all CM one profitable, right? And most yes. most are CM two profitable as well as we speak. And see, finally, as founders, you are not building it for investors; you are building it for yourself. And if your company is not CM one profitable, the moment you scale and you try to become CM one profitable, your customers will go away, and you would not have built a business. So, uh, it, it, it's end state good quality business that we are talking about. And on day one, from day one, being strict on on being CM one profitable helps you get there. Yeah, and either have the control on the levers, right? You know, if this changes, then I can turn to profitability. Clear. So actually, so to just to you know close this conversation, given we have shared all the insights and you have shared across uh, uh, different stages across portfolios, what have been our learnings like, right? So with all of this, right, where does this go ahead? What is our outlook for the next five to ten years? I mean, as Matrix, we know we have been very bullish on B two B, but there are statements coming along, or like the noise in the space, right? That probably this was the time, and now. You know, there there are going to be other sectors which take the bait in the head or something like that, right? And now there are going to be corrections in the valuations. Couple of companies are under the scanner. You know, there are problems to the sector. So how do you put all of it together? And what is your uh, you know outlook on B two B future? So there are two parts to it, right? First, am I bullish on India? Definitely. and part of being bullish on india is being bullish on indian msmes indian farmers indian manufacturers indian retailers i think there's a huge amount of potential and for all the things we discussed combined with china plus one and global sort of supply chain realignment indian msmes over the 10 years will do really really well that's the big core belief right now the question is business so will b2b do well in india definitely now the question is vc funded b2b startups will they do well in india or not right I believe most companies in in B two B are truly adding value to the sector. Like 
it will never be all in any sector and i don't know enough about all companies to also comment i can only comment about our portfolio right i think most companies are doing it in the right way and building the right set of companies now our valuations ahead of time i think that was true for almost the entire industry last year will a lot of some of the companies have to grow into valuations over the next 6 to 12 years 6 to 12 months definitely they will do right uh, if you look at public markets most b2b companies are probably valued at anywhere between 20 to 40x or sort of ebitda right so will companies need to figure out a way to 5 to 10% ebitda to justify their current valuations definitely obviously b2b companies which have better growth and better roc can even command better multiples but there will be an overall correction in valuation multiples yes come the good companies will take 6 to 12 months to grow into the valuation says yes. the companies today were still undervalued and will continue to perform yes and there might be some companies which will need to uh, sort of uh, figure things out and, and figure it out out right but the good thing about b2b is it's not a very capital intensive sector so if you're building the company the right way and if your working capital is within check There's still enough and more amount of money to build a large enduring businesses. So we are in the business of building great businesses which create value. Valuation is cyclical, uh, yeah. but if you ask me, will great B two B businesses be built out of India? I'm a very very strong believer of that. In the near term, will valuations go up and down? Yes, but that's okay because all the founders, luckily that we are working with, are looking at building ten, twenty year companies, doing IPO, building a legacy. you know we are long term investors so the next 6 12 months of of valuation really does not impact us uh, we have done a lot in b2b in the last two years which you have seen as you know we are closing two deals in b2b and we definitely would love to double down and spend more time in b2b now if i look at in terms of sectors right uh, we have heavily invested in the b2r sector which is factory or farmer to the retailer um, and now you are doing a bunch of companies in the export import space which is excel Uh, you know we are bullish on input raw materials and there are multiple different raw material sectors that we are sort of looking at and we would like to invest in 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 the next 12 to 18 months along with that companies that help help improve productivity of the smes right of the farmers of the far, of the manufacturers of the retailers i think that's also core area of interest for us going forward so overall super bullish on b2b uh, have been very privileged to work with some really really amazing entrepreneurs in this space um big believer in in when b2b enabling digital growth and digital nation building and pushing gdp forward and super committed to invest in b2b over the next few years thanks gupto and more part of the b2b sector and hopefully you know it continues to do well and we continue to take our share from the founders and the ones who do well but uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and hopefully this session was helpful for our viewers if if there's anything that we talked about uh, around which you want to discuss further please feel free to drop a line and thank you for tuning in thanks Thanks for tuning in. For more Matrix Moments episodes, you can head to www.matrixpartners.in/matrixmoments. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more updates.